Do you know that feeling? When you try to reason about concurrent code, that your brain gets all foggy and you have no idea where to start from? When that happens, I usually try to come up with some physical analogy, something that I can actually touch, so I can see the state of the system play out in the real world. Usually it's pen, paper, and maybe some sticky notes if I'm feeling particularly fancy. Or stuck. Do these tricks work? No. No, they don't. But they make me feel as if I'm making progress and in the end, is it that what counts? So, you can imagine my joy when I learned that IO Euring takes care of multithreading for me. Sure, it may call it asynchronous I.O. and sure, that's not multithreading. But hey, I won't let trivial things like correctness to stand between me and an imagined world where I no longer need to draw boxes and arrows. In reality, of course, Using I.O. Euring directly isn't as simple as developing a single threaded application. After all, as we'll see, we are controlling a batch of kernel worker tasks from a user space application, so things get interesting. And that's what this video is about. Developing a small program in Rust that is single threaded but does concurrent reads and writes by using I.O. Euring. Does that sound interesting? Of course it does. Is it simple? Well, you be the judge. Here's what we've got to work with. As we saw in the previous video, we have two rings, one for submitting requests and one for receiving completion entries. The straightforward way to use this is to submit a bunch of requests, let the kernel know, and then wait for the corresponding completion entries to show up, rip them and keep doing it all over. By the way, if what I'm describing doesn't make sense, it may help you to go and see my previous video for an introduction to I.O. Euring. Link up there and in the doobly-doo. The small program we wrote last time worked just fine, provided we were happy with doing one request at a time. The same basic structure can do multiple requests in batches. Nothing wrong with that, batch processing is totally natural, nothing to be ashamed of. But it's not exactly asynchronous, is it? And when all I have is a single thread, I don't want it to sit around, slacking, waiting for batches to complete. I want it to be busy all the time. To do that, let's take a closer look at what is happening on the kernel side of things when a file read or write SQE is submitted. When the kernel picks up our SQE, it will go through some checks to figure out if the request can be executed with polling or if it needs to block. In our case, it needs to block, which means it will need to spawn a kernel worker thread to wait for the operation to complete. And we can see that happening in real time. In the second part of the video, we'll write a small single threaded application that copies the contents of a file to a new location on disk using I.O. Euring. I'm going to execute it, and while it's running, I'll ask the PS utility to tell me how many kernel threads the application spawned. As you can see, our program spawns a few. I can even catch it with IOTOP and see that they are IO Euring worker threads. Since we're talking about kernel tasks, we might as well take a look at the kernel sources and demystify the whole thing. We'll start at the QSQE function, which does the check for blocking or polling IO. In our case, it will opt for blocking, which leads it to the QAsync so it can spawn a worker thread. From there, we get to QIO, which will create the IO worker and conveniently will also call a trace event. From there, we follow the chain from worker and queue all the way to create IO thread, which will end up spawning the kernel task. If all this is correct, then by using the perf tool, we should see the trace event from the queuing of the IO worker. Let's try that. That's a few million calls to queuing async work which means our read of the kernel sources is accurate. What does this all mean then? For me, knowing all this helps me think of my application as the orchestrator of a bunch of kernel threads. It helps me architect my code around the task management framework, which is different than the traditional way of doing I.O. So let's try this small application around this idea, see what it looks like. 
Before we start, a word of warning. This is just a demo, so we can understand how things work. I cannot stress enough that this is not production quality code. Frankly, I'm surprised it even compiles. I've made a lot of assumptions, some of which I've documented in comments, just to give you some hints of how subtle things can be. What I'm trying to say is, don't show up at your stand-up tomorrow morning and start talking about how you've got a new idea for a new I.O. layer and then be surprised when a user runs your app over an NFS mount and your code collapses into a singularity. With that out of the way, let's write some code to copy a file. Since the design is a single thread controlling the kernel workers through a U-ring, we're going to need 1. A way to split up work into requests and 2 a way to keep track of those requests. If you recall, Uring entries have a user data field that we could use, but it's only 64 bits long, so we can basically only hold an index or a pointer. Let's create then a request structure that holds all the information we need and that can be referenced by the user data field. For this program, a request is either a read operation or a write operation, from some offset and for some length. I have hardwired the files in the code so we don't need to worry about tracking source and destination files in the requests. Kinda hacky, but it keeps things simpler. The idea is that requests go through a state machine. They start as a no-op. As long as reads are needed, the code will make them into read-ops at an offset and for a length. Once the CQE for the read is seen, it will move to a write-op for the same offset and length, but this time for the target file. Then the request is done and it can be reused. We're also going to need some buffers to read and write data from and to. I will manage those separately in a structure I'll call page. Why call it a page? Well, if you think you know, put your answer in the comments. A page contains the buffer, obviously, plus some housekeeping information. It needs to know if it is waiting to be written out or not, so it needs a dirty flag. It also needs an in-use flag that basically functions as a lock to avoid using the same page from two different requests and end up corrupting data. Finally, the ID is just for convenience, so we can refer to it from a request with a simple index operation. Let's look at the control loop now. Big picture, we want to copy a file. This means we need to submit a read request at an offset and length from the source, receive acknowledgement that it completed, make a request to write to the target file at the same offset and length, and keep doing that until we've read through the whole source and no more requests remain. In the first part of the loop, for each iteration, we'll pick up a request from the list and execute it. Or if we have reads left to do, it'll create them. All that goes to the submission queue, of course. In the second part of the loop, we reap all the completion entries we can. Each CQE has the index for the request in the user data field, so we can look it up and move it along the state machine. Note that in each iteration we do one submission but reap all the CQEs we can. This ensures that we will never overflow the completion queue and risk losing the state of a request. That would be a problem. There are better ways to do this, but that's a topic for a different video. And that's all there is to it, really. Of course, you can download the code and play around with it. There are lots of interesting behaviors you can experiment with. As always, links and references in the description. So there you have it. One way to structure an asynchronous application on top of I.O. Uring. To be honest, now that I've talked through it, it doesn't seem that complicated. Thank you for sticking around. I know I ended the last video saying we'll talk about performance next, but come on. Don't tell me that this wasn't interesting. First fair though, I don't want to be a tease. Next time we'll do some benchmarks and see where we get. Thank you for watching and take care.